Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Severa Davis. I'm Director of Design and Challenges and Director of the Student Design Awards here at the RSA. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to today's special event, uh, particularly on the sunshine, um, with the sunshine outside. So just before we begin, could I please ask you to turn your mobile phones to silent? And I'd also like to let you know that we're filming today and live streaming over the web. So welcome and hello to all of our online viewers and a reminder that the hashtag is RSA Manzini if you'd like to get involved in the discussion on Twitter. Now, housekeeping notice is over. It is my great pleasure to introduce this afternoon's distinguished guest speaker, Ezio Manzini. Ezio is Chair Professor of Design for Social Innovation at the University of the Arts London, as well as Honorary Professor at the Politecnico di Milano. Ezio has been working in the field of design for sustainability for more than two decades, and most recently his interests have focused on social innovation, which is considered a major driver for sustainable change in today's society. Ezio founded DSIS, which is a network of international design schools specifically active in the field of design for social innovation and sustainability. I suspect many of you are familiar and part of the DSIS network. We are delighted to welcome Ezio today to talk about his book, uh, Design When Everyone Designs, Everybody Designs, excuse me, which describes how we can create conditions for individuals, communities, and organizations to move toward a more resilient, um, dynamic and sustainable society. Ezio will highlight forms of collaboration between design professionals and communities that have real impact. I'm delighted that he's speaking on this today because it's particularly relevant to us here at the RSA, where we believe that meaningful social change happens when everyone has access to the knowledge, resources and networks to have, um, make ideas into a reality. Ezio is going to speak for around 20 minutes or so, and then I'll ask Ezio a few questions about uh, what he spoke about, and then we're going to open it up to the floor for all of you to ask questions and comment. We'll wrap up promptly at 2 p.m. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Ezio Manzini. Can you tell me when it's a quarter of an hour with yes. you speaking? Thank you. Okay, thank you, and good afternoon. I'm going to present a book. A book is quite complex, so I have to give an overview. But at the same time, I like conversation in which there is a focus. So what I will try to do is to balance in between give you an overview of the book, but at the same time try to bring the conversation in a direction that is the one that for me now is more crucial. And just to say which, who is the, the killer from the beginning, the killer is uh, the design culture. So I want to bring the conversation toward the desperate need that we have to develop a design culture in the present days. So to, to introduce the book, uh, I prepared a kind of map. What happened? I did so. A kind of map that is a navigation tool to help in making the journey in the concept of the book. Of course, I'm not going to tell everything about all the world that you can see there. I put here now simply to give you a little bit the sense of where we are. And all these words are in some way in the book. But the book is mainly on two focus. Even if we start from multiple crises and we want to go towards a sustainable society, but the focus of the book, where hopefully there is some originality, it's about the changing nature of design that I call emerging design and the social innovation and the overlapping in between the two. So what the new design that is appearing can do to promote, to trigger, to promote and to sustain a, in a good direction uh, the social innovation. So let, let's move from a kind of phenomenological observation. In the last 20 years, the term design has been stretched in many different directions. So from designing products or uh, uh, graphic artifacts toward the service design, toward strategic design, toward design of organization, toward design of social organization, toward design of policy, and toward design of policy for social change. And I have to say that uh, London has been a kind of Hollywood of this kind of transformation. Personally, and all the people that I know that are dealing with this kind of story have had in the last 20 years a very important reference to what happened 
in London and mainly not in London as a city, but in London as uh, some organization, some center, people and organization that really was studying about social innovation and about new way of doing design. So this emerging design in our map is uh, a design that can be <coughs> applied practically to every kind of problems. And I add every kind of problems in which the cultural dimension and the practical dimension cannot be separated. Because if it is only a cultural issue, it's not design. If it is only a technical issue, it's not design. For me, somebody called them wicked, wicked problems. I prefer to see simply that there are problems in which the human being are there. Because when you cannot separate the practicalities from the culture, it means that it's a human story. So every time that we have some human-related something, artifact situation system, uh, we could use our design capability. And uh, the second is that in this transformation of design, <clears throat> what is happening, and I'm not the only one that tells the story in this way, luckily there are many others, is that uh, the natural design changes from being always referred to what you design, a product, a system, a service, toward a toolkit, let's say a set of capability, tools, methodologies, culture, that define a way of doing things. So it's much more related to a toolkit than to the result, because the result is always the result of many people working together and creating the final objects, the final system that we are dealing with. The, another point that is important to be said, at least especially if I talk and I've been introduced as somebody that deals with sustainability, is not that all the emerging design and therefore the service design, the strategic design, and all the kind of design that we have are good for sustainability. They could be good for sustainability, but they could be also against sustainability, as always has been. Also the previous, the previous century design, sometimes it worked for the good and sometimes very often it worked for the worst, to increase the consumption, to increase the consumeristic attitude. So also the emerging design can use all the new tools for the good, and this is what I, I think, I hope that you will share with me, but it can also work to create even worse society than the one that we have know, known until now. The second point is that uh, we can talk about design, and we have talked for 20 years about design in different ways. All of them can be correct, but we have to understand what we are talking about, because there are at least three different ways of talking about design. There is one point that is the one that for me is fundamental, that design is a human capability. And as therefore, everybody can use this capability to design, because design is a mixture of critical sense. So we have to look to the reality and, and imagine that could, and see something that do not work. Creativity, that imagine how it could be in another way. And the practical sense, that means how it could be in another way, but in a viable way, so that we can do it. And here, if you want being in this place, it's very interesting, could be interesting to discuss if what I'm telling now is exactly the same that is one of the main strategy of RSA that is about the power to create. And the idea that has been so well presented by Matthew Taylor that we think that everybody should have the possibility to live a creative life. So this is one of the main statements today of RSA. That is very near to what I'm saying but uh, I am not going to discuss now. There are a little bit of differences. I understand why somebody talk about creativity because it's simpler. But at the same time, I think that what people need is not only to be creative, but to be capable to design because it's not only to imagine something, it's also to make it real. And by the way, it has been in some way like this. It's not only an aspiration. Some sociologues started from, uh, from Giddens and arriving to uh, to, um, to Ulrich Beck says that the modernity can be defined as a condition in which people are obliged to design their own biography. Therefore, uh, to design is not to be creative or to be designer today is not only an aspiration. It's an aspiration to be capable to design well and to use uh, 
Sen, uh, that has been quoted also by Matthew, uh, author is uh, to be capable to be what you want to be and to do what you want to do. But uh, in any case, we are forced to invent our life. And very often we are frustrated by this. So to design and to be creative is not only the aspiration for the good, it could be also an obligation. And here, in my view, comes also the role of the design expert. Because if everybody has to be creative or everybody has to design, there are somebody that have studied, that have done some studies, that have done some special experiences. There are probably many in between you and me, of course, that we define ourselves as designers. And so it's very important to understand what makes the expert designer different from all the others. And what makes us, the designer, different from the others is that all the others are design amateurs. And we are design experts in some way. It's already 10 minutes? 15? Oh my god. <laughs> the interaction in between the two is co design. That means the fact that expert designers and other people with different profession in the, in the connected society interact, and so we have the co design. Therefore, a little bit of confusion happens because the co design is multidisciplinary by definition. The expert design is a specific discipline, and this specific discipline should be defined for its own tools, method, and culture. Uh, another issue is that we have uh, the design, at least I hope that you will agree, is designed because it put together the problem-solving capability with the sense-making one. And this has always been like that. And this is designed exactly because there is this double link in between doing something and having a production of meaning about what we are doing and vice versa. Creating meaning but based on something that is a kind of solution for some problems. And this should be valuable also for emerging design in which we should produce solutions and on the other side we have to produce some meanings. But until now, for two decades in which we started to deal with this new kind of design, all the conversation has been on the problem solving, on uh, how we can look in the reality, see many problems, and see how we can solve these problems. And this seems to be very solid, very concrete. I would say, as in Italian, a very Anglo-Saxon. So very pragmatical. And it's good. If things do not work, it's no reason to make design. OK. But given that we have always a cultural side, if you don't consciously deal with the cultural side, you have a kind of subculture that could be called solutionism. That is the idea that everything can be reduced to find solution, where human beings are living in a much richer environment in which we need a hope, system of meaning, sense, stories. And this is what, in my view, is desperately mi missing today. And is missing for what I'm talking now, that has a new kind of design, but I think it's missing in general in the society. So as I said, uh, I think that it's very important today to develop what are the meaning of what we can generate and how, given the crisis of the idea of future, the crisis of idea, for instance, we are in Europe, but what is Europe today? And we should say what the design activity can bring beyond specific solutions to new ideas. So what is the prosperity in Europe? And what could be the future of our continent? Now, <clears throat> I think, you tell me when I finish. I finish, yeah. <laughs> uh, social innovation is there. The interesting point of social innovation is that we can observe some radical element that I call local discontinuity. So the system is more or less the same, but you can see something boiling that generates some new way of doing. And these are the good news. Even in the world where there are so many, unfortunately, bad news, if you have the right uh, glasses, you can recognize several good news that are hundreds of millions of people that in this way are also capable without waiting for uh, new laws, without waiting for uh, some, somebody giving the direction to do things in a different way. 
And uh, they are a very special kind of innovation, bottom-up, radical innovation. And there is something that is in common, that they are based on uh, participation and collaboration. And the radicality of the change is that all the discussion about modernity has been seen as a progress toward individualization, to be more and more individual. And now you have that those people that are sufficiently individualized discover the beauty, the power, and the opportunity linked to restart, to collaborate. And therefore, you have a collaborative way of living, collaborative way of working, collaborative way of organizing the services, collaborative way of creating food networks. And this is the discovery of collaboration. And uh, what we can say that there are, as designers, we can say that have been invented hundreds of solutions. And these solutions are, at the same time, they solve problems, elderly, mobility, etc. But at the same time, they produce social link. So they produce sociality. So they have not only one result. The result is solve the problem and generate as a kind of very valuable byproducts, sociality. And in some way, they anticipate way of doing that could be seen as way of doing of a sustainable society. This is why they are so interesting. The second point is that uh, today in the complexity of the, our society and the way in which the phenomenon happens, we have uh, some of them that is still at the stage of an invention. So you have some heroes, social heroes, that invent a way of doing things totally against what have been the mainstreams. Some of these ideas can consolidate and become more structured organization and a kind of movement in the society that start to move in a certain direction. And afterward, they could become a change in behavior. And in this moment, depending where you look, you can see different stages in this process because you can see the original inventor in some cases, as could be if you take food, for instance, could be the first food people dealing with organic food 20 or 30 years ago. And afterward, you have a kind of movement that could be as a slow food and similar. And afterward, you start to have new supermarket, a new way to organize the overall system, taking account organic, local, et cetera, et cetera. And at the same time, you have different actors. So there are what we can call the creative communities, so a group of people that are really very creative and change the reality in which they are. And afterward, they can consolidate in collaborative organization. And afterward, they can generate new extended behavior. And uh, what I want to say, maybe I'd say one thing more and after I finish, is that uh, all of this has something to do with design and will be designed for social innovation. And uh, there is a growing responsibility for design expert, the more than the innovation became mature. I will give you this example that I'm sure that everybody knows, but exactly because everybody knows, you can understand, it's easier to be explained. If we take our pooling, it's a very simple idea. You can use better an asset, people capable to drive and the car. The beginning of the story, there was a nice group of people doing it in a very alternative way. And there have been some designers that designed with these people. So this is the design with the community to promote and to help them to exist and to consolidate in time. And afterwards, when the institution started to recognize that carpooling could be interesting, we had some norms and some new rules. And so you can have design for communities. So design to help the communities to be easier, to have an easier life. And afterward, you can have dedicated technologies. At the beginning, there was no dedicated technology. It was done with the very normal technologies. At a certain point, when they started to spread, you had a specific technology, maybe at the beginning, the digital one, and in some cases, not here, also the physical one. And you have to use service design in that case. And afterward, you have also new enterprise around the issue about carpooling. You have several new enterprises that have to be designed. So you have a strategic design that enter. And afterward, you have Uber. <laughs> and uh, we can ask, so I 
heard somebody laughing a little bit. It's, 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 we have Uber, and I have to say also myself, that I'm supposed to be expert, I've been taken a little bit surprised from what was happening. And Uber became the Uberization, because there is not only Uber, but there are that one that is task rabbit or that one that is handy, and they all have in common that they take some ideas from this original sharing economy and they bring it in what is called the platform economy that is a hyper capitalistic intensity of being uh, exploiting the people capabilities, in my view. But in any case, it should be discussed, and there is a discussion, but the discussion until now is not so much done by the designers. It's mainly done by people that deal with work and the problem of the work in the platform economy. So I think that it, when I said that it's an increasing responsibility for the designer, you can follow in this example. Because at the beginning, there was this nice community. They were doing so well. We work with them. And we have not to develop any specific cultural idea, any specific value, because we are in some way behind the heroes that are already doing something that is very good. But when, if successful, and the start to have more possibility, more technology, and more money, at that point, you need to have expert designer, and here they have been expert designer because Uber and all the other are perfectly designed, and they are perfectly designed, user-centered design, so they are really so easy to be used, and so, uh, so effective by the point of view of the user. But maybe they have other problems. And if there are other problems, as I think, we should have a culture that permits to criticize it, to see if and where in the transformation, in the evolution of the innovation from the original invention toward the movement, toward the mature innovation, where things could have been different from this. And this, in my view, is where the culture of design, we should be capable to enter in the process bringing visions, bringing point of view, and discussing, of course, in a modest way, in a dialogical way, by bringing this kind of contribution. Where we can take it, again, from the social innovation. So when we go back to the social innovation as originally had been, we can find that there are a lot of interesting way of doing that appear. So the original, the inventor of the social innovation generate a new sense of time, Normally, there is a more slow time, that is a kind of ecology of time. There is a different sense of work. People are doing something they like, so they reintroduce the notion of work. There is a new sense of place, so they re are place builders. And finally, and mainly, there are a different idea of relationships and the quality of the relationships. All this could be the beginning of a new story and could be the beginning of a story about a future that to be an interesting future should propose an idea of prosperity and the prosperity could be the prosperity of this kind of interaction that are to be more richer. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Ezio. Um, I think what I imagine is that that last example of the carpooling probably brought it to life for many people here. And I have the advantage that I've read the book and I know that it's full of lots of other examples. But I wonder if you could take us through some of those other ones. I'm thinking particularly you men mentioned circles in the UK, collaborative housing in Milan, and, and take us through that story and how those are examples of design for social innovation. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I like to use the example of uh, housing because it's an Italian one, so I feel easier for this and take some English ones. But what, what I want to say is that uh, to make the example today, as opposed as it was to make the example 10 years ago when it happened to me and many other friends to start this uh, work in design for social innovation, um, we have to keep in account of the example not only the picture, but the film. <laughs> So what happened in time? So when I started, and I have to say, not now to, to say don't, book, don't buy the book, but the book is a book. So I wrote it some times ago, and we are sitting on a kind of a 
continuously changing situation. So the beginning of our story was a story in which, in which was enough to take a kind of a snapshot, a picture of what is happening. Now we need to have a movie that means to see what happened. So in the case of um, housing, uh, I like to use it because uh, it's one of the areas in which the transformation is still weaker. So for instance, if we talk about uh, food, everywhere in the world today, everybody understands at least that there is another strategy, that the strategy that is based on industrial agriculture, industrial distribution, big, etc., uh, etc., cetera, et cetera, is not the only one. There is another one. The key words are uh, organic, local, uh, seasonal, etc., etc. And everybody understands normally. Maybe not everybody practices in the right way, but everybody understands. Because a lot of people work on this, and in my view there have been uh, also people working on culture and representation set. When you talk about the uh, way of living in your home, I, will not, I, I could make the, also an experiment here. Normally, if you say, well, there could be a different way of living, maybe sharing some services, etc., quasi every time there is somebody that says, hey, Manzini, you are still to the hippie communities or the kibbutz, or, and what does it mean? It means that it's a weak, a cultural weakness because uh, we don't have an image of how we could live in a less stupid way than the one in which we live today. Because we, <laughs> we still live in houses that have been built in the Victorian age for family done in a certain way. Now the families are totally diverse. So why we should still live in the same boxes? It's totally irrational, but it's still like this. The family are mainly two people, or one people and, and 50. Go. Uh, we started to work on co-housing uh, 10 years ago, and uh, the idea was co-housing exists, so it means the families that go together and uh, share, decide to share something because they like to share and because it's also convenient to share. And we worked on that, and uh, it was quite successful. The result of this work was uh, that was easier to do it because to organize a co-housing is very complex because you, you have to find other people that have the same wish to do the same thing in the same time in the same place. So it's very complicated. So we create a system that makes it easier to organize the group using uh, digital uh, tools, using a larger community that permits to find who was uh, available, available to start something in a certain point. But afterwards, we recognize the co-housing it was a too rigid solution. So in some way, co-housing uh, creates a group of people that risk to close itself. And so the co-housing could also bring to another different risk that I've not mentioned today, that he, we talk about community and the community become we against the others. That is one of the big risks that we have today. Therefore, we started to think how to promote something that was uh, with the same idea of sharing, but uh, more open and larger. And therefore, we have, have, we have been lucky to find uh, the, the foundation in Milano, that is a found in Italy, let's say, it's based in Milano, that is called the Social Housing Foundation, that is started by a bank. And they have the social housing, as also here, I know that you have the social housing. And the social housing there, as I think it's also here, was mainly housed with a certain price that was not so, so, so low as the real popular ones, but out of the market. And you have the list of people that apply. So we started to work with them, and uh, the result, and you can uh, browse and you can find this very, now there are also some examples that are already working and seem to work very well. To extend the idea of the co-housing, I will say using my terminology in a more mature way, open to more people, because they call the social housing is open to many people. And the result is that now there are a kind of double yard, the one in which is built the physical house, and the one in which is built the social organization of the people. They discuss what they want to put in common, what they want to share, etc., etc. I like this example because we can say that now, after more than 10 years, it's sufficiently mature. Uh, but it's a way to be mature that maintains some of the original character, that is to help to create community, 
to create a link in between, horizontal link in between people and the links with the place. Okay? Yes. <laughs> but do you think that it sounds, what you've described is something that worked because it wasn't too far away from what was already the known. And I think there's something about matching the social space with a familiarity mm -hmm. that has been why it's been successful, but it's, as it's taken time to mature as well, it might become something else. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Uh, I, I'm not sure that I understood 100% the question, but if the question was how this form of organization can happen and how they can evolve in time, is this was the question? I guess I'm, I'm thinking particularly that the example that you've given, the, you've talked about sort of the forms of housing that we live in and, and that the project that you yeah. spoke about particularly was based on things that are already familiar to communities. So it, it didn't feel like something too far away from what they already knew, but yeah. capitalized on that need for a social space and kind of a need yeah. for people to, to be together in that way. The, the, the final result is okay. I, I think that it's very, di very diverse for what at least an Italian or but I think also people in UK think about your home. Because the difficulties with the home is that you do not change the home so frequently in life. So if it is not so difficult to enter in a purchasing group in the food co-op, if you, I don't like it, I get out and do something else. But if you have to buy a house or even rent a house but move in a house, you inevitably think to the future. And so the strength of the stereotype is very strong. And therefore, to imagine that you buy a house in which you share something with your neighbors uh, is not so easy to be imagined. And there are both a change in mentality and also change in the way in which you physically do it and the, the laws and the norms that permit to give us the flexibility that we expect for our life, but at the same time uh, to cre help to create a kind of positive interaction in between people that live nearby for uh, psychological reason and also for practical reason because the daily life is easier if you have around the people with whom you can share something. So it's a kind of, a, we have to say it's very diverse if we are in UK or in Italy or if you are in other places. So this is really very culturally uh, related. But if you are here or in Milano, uh, you have people that are very individualized that have to make a kind of a compromise in between your uh, idea of freedom. I am totally free and so nobody has to interfere in what I'm doing. And the fact that if you do something with somebody else, could be useful, could be nice also by other point of view. So the design should be capable to propose practical way of doing it and a, a culture that gives the idea that this is the best way to do it. Even now I will say a very bad word, but even fashionable. So it's something, it's a little bit as it happened with the bike. Now everybody use the bike, it's very fa fashionable. Good, if, if it is at the end the people go by bike and not by car, why not? So what we can do to create a new kind of attitude that recognize, for instance, in this different way of living, the most smart, the most intelligent, etc. At the same time, in that case, avoiding the trap of closing yourself in a kind of gated community or those that have uh, something similar against uh, and very with the wall against all the other ones. So they, they, in some way, when we move from the beginning of the story toward the maturity, we have to risk. One of the is Uberization, that is a hyper neoliberal attitude. You are entrepreneur of yourself. You are too free to do what you want, to exploit yourself, and we can gain on what you are doing. This is one thing. And the other thing is, oh, the world is so terrible, so difficult, it's so dangerous. We have to close ourselves, to find our friend, to close in our walls. And uh, so we use it, they use the term community and place in a very dangerous way. And uh, the, when I say that it's a desperate need for a culture, it's because we need to navigate in the middle of these two kind of very uh, dangerous traps that we can have. 
And at the beginning, 10 years ago, it seems uh, much easier, simpler. There was this nice community. They were doing good things. So let's do what they are doing. But nowadays, things uh, positively change because it's more mature. And exactly because it's mature, there are interest, there is money, there is uh, political interest. And so we have to clarify some ideas. Great, thank you. I have one final question for you before we open it up to the audience and uh, something that I think might be uh, something that people here would like to know, which is about your own journey, how you got to where you are today and how you found that design for social innovation was something that you wanted to pursue. <laughs> you told me you'd be okay with that question. <laughs> you want the people have a nap now? <laughs> No, well, everybody has, uh, my, by chance, <laughs> as every important thing that you do in your life is by chance. <laughs> uh, by chance, uh, I became a designer. By chance, I was not a real, a normal designer, so I became a strange designer for the beginning. I was in, somebody, the oldest one, maybe remember Domus Academy, that was a very important, at the time, place. And it happened to me too. In Domus Academy, somebody should write a story about Domus Academy because it was a place where everything started. Everything that I'm saying now is, was already a little bit in Domus Academy in the 80, 85, 87. And, um, and afterwards, um, I always been uh, very political from the beginning. Before being a designer, I was uh, involved in a lot of politics. So. Uh, and at a certain point, I put together everything. And afterward, when uh, the notion of sustainability appeared clear, I, and I say, yeah, th this is what we have to do. We have to work as a designer, if you're a designer, to sustainability. And it happened to me to follow. So I'm not a genius. So I was, oh, I'm always working with what is happening around me. So we moved from dealing with materials, uh, to products, to product service system, to service strategies, and now this one. And this one happened to me and to many others that we, at a certain point, discovered that innovation was not only the technological innovation. It's obvious when you say it, but many people in between me have never thought <laughs> that innovation was not only the technological one. And this happened more or less 15 years ago. And so we start to look to this innovation and we move from the creative community. For me, and I stop here, uh, the beginning was uh, um, that I, I, I hated all the idea about uh, creative society as it was. And uh, I wanted to show the creative class or creative society. And I wanted to show that creativity was much more diffuse. So we started the research and also with the uh, Josephine Green, that is here when she was in Philips, on uh, what we call the creative communities. It was a research for the European community. And uh, we discovered, we discovered, because probably many other people have already seen it, that in the, there were hundreds of thousands of people that was already doing something different. And so from there, we started to work as a designer with these communities. And afterward, everybody in the world discovers social innovation. And now it's a buzzword that everybody uses it, luckily. And uh, of course, also the designer discovered that you can design for social innovation. So it happened to me and my colleagues and my group, because what the story that I tell are all collective stories. So I can put my voice, but uh, everything happened because I work. It's not something that you can read in the book. It's, you have to do something, and afterward, you can make some reflection on what you did. And therefore, we arrived at this point in which I, I think that we are in a turning point. So if, if you feel that I'm so passionate in telling, look, that we have to understand where we are and the risk, also not only the opportunity, but the risk that we are today, is because in my story, I understand that we have been, in my DNA, there are the creative community. This is what I liked from the beginning, and work with the community. But as a designer now, I recognize that we have to be capable to work for social innovation at every stage. And as I said before, in my view, our responsibility. So the creative community working up well also without us. <laughs> Where when the story starts to become much more solid, so the innovation moves from the origin toward the mature innovation, the community per se can give opinion, but it's too, too complicated. So you need some expert. 
and the expert have a responsibility. And therefore, at that point, it's really to understand what we can do to try to use this incredible energy that is a possibility that also the story about the power of creation talk about this uh, possibility, and I agree. But I think, and probably also Matthew Taylor will agree, that this energy could also move in direction that is not necessarily the best one. And uh, who can tell who is the best one? Nobody. Also the Pope says who I am to say who <laughs> is the best one. So if, when I quote the Pope, it means that it's finished. <laughs> uh, Excellent. No, um, I'd now like to open it up to the audience. There are roving microphones. Uh, so if you can please raise your hand and wait for the microphone to come to you. I'm seeing four hands, so I'll just take um, the two in the center here, and then we'll take the two at the back after that. So we've got, um, yes, first you, and then we'll take your question afterwards, and Ezio will answer them together. Can innovative collaboration uh, succeed better only when it's ground up? You can't have it imposed from above. And I'm thinking of an example, the Euro, which is very innovative and uh, collaborative, but has terrible flaws. <laughs> yeah, um, beyond the, the example of the Euro, that is a little bit beyond my capability now to <laughs> um, I, I think, and in, in my DNA, and if you read the book, and also if you listen to what I said, all the, the story is told mainly from the bottom up. But in my view, the reality, if you look what happens, is a, a little bit more complicated than this. In my view, everything that happened in this direction has to have a strong role of the people that have to be willing to do it. So if people do not want to will to do it, nothing happens. So they cannot be imposed from, from the top. But uh, the way in which it starts and the way in which it consolidates it's a much more complex uh, kind of ecosystem in between different peer-to-peer, bottom-up, top-down, so three different kind of links. And at a certain point of the story, you definitely need uh, the top-down. So at a certain point of the story, some institution should play the good role of the institution, because very frequently we say institution, we think bureaucracy, etc., etc. but institution are necessary, are a kind of way to consolidate some good result. So we should see a kind of inspiration, expiration in between a creativity, disruptive creativity that breaks some rules. And afterward, if the institutions are sufficiently clever and flexible, they should recognize what is the good in uh, the new thing that happened and in some way consolidate. And consolidate is because uh, the new that is done by the heroes a human being, a group of human beings that have a biological core. You become old, you die, you are sick, you are fed up. So it's important that when uh, this trajectory, the personal trajectory start to decline, the institution is capable to give some rules that permit to somebody that is less motivated of the first one to enter in play. So when you have something after 30 years that still work, it means that there has been a good interaction in between the bottom up and the top down. To give an example that is, maybe there are many, but this is the one that many people know. If we take uh, the community garden, probably also here, but I know the one in New York, they have 35 years and they are still community doing it. But our communities that are less uh, let's say, disruptive at the beginning, because the beginning of the community garden was movement of guerrilla gardening that was squatting and making also crash against the police. So at a certain point, they find a kind of compromise, positive compromise in between the community and the institutions. And now you have the Green Thumb, that is an organization of the New York Council that uh, offer to the community the right gentle way of not uh, degenerate because there are some rules and at the same time help in making all the story easier and in this way you do not need to be a hero to participate to a community garden. You can be a much more normal person that, uh, by the way, Sunday or Saturday or another day in the week, work a little bit. 
this today, and if we really imagine that they are not only small groups, but they are the beginning of a new story, the issue about what the institutions are and how they can int positively interact with what happened from the bottom, it's again one of the major problems, because from the bottom it's relatively clear. It's how the institution manage with them that is still uh, open and discussable, even though there are some some ideas around us, luckily there are. Uh, and the question here? Yes, yep. Um, yeah, I'm uh, Guy Julia, I'm a professor of design culture, so um, I was very excited, obviously, when you talk about new design culture, because that kind of means that I'm still in a job. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'm just interested in, you know, this, this route, how you navigate towards this new design culture, because it seems to me that it's really fundamentally important that we understand that's called old design culture or dominant design culture. In other words, what are the sort of economic and political underpinnings which give rise to the current frameworks in which we live and practice? So in other words, to put it more simply, you know, you talked about sort of expert designers, but surely those expert designers should have a really fundamental um, knowledge uh, and skill in knowing how power works, for example, in municipalities or in governments or in corporations, so therefore know how to navigate projects through that or how to find openings and fissures in, uh, in these kinds of institutions to carry these sorts of good works forward. Yeah. Well, maybe the, uh, I can say I agree. <laughs> and uh, maybe I could delete the new and uh, simply say that it's a design culture. Uh, sometimes we use too much new, but uh, in that case it was a new simply because uh, if we talk about uh, the emerging design, the culture of the emerging design until now, for me, is solutionism. So solutionism is a culture, also that one, even if it is a culture that in my view is not rich and deep enough. If you say that we should uh, be capable to also to link the new ideas, so what is needed now with the history, so to know the history, I, I totally agree. And, uh, Maybe I don't know if I'm capable to do, but as an Italian, uh, I, well, I, I could talk about the Italian design, and I could talk about, uh, it's an, in Italy especially, it's fundamental to have a discussion about the culture of design. Because in Italy, when you talk about design, it's mainly culture. But the culture of the Italian design that has been so, the older in between you know, so has been so powerful for decades, uh, in some way degenerated in something that is only related to kind of discussion about the luxury goods. And the Italian design was nothing, with it. it was revolutionary. All the Italian design, the master of the Italian design was bloody communist. And, uh, and they was, and they were thinking to make the revolution through what they did it. So when I see as a designer what the, the Italian design became today and the discussion about what is this Italian design that is in the page of the luxury goods, it's something that I can, I can cry. And therefore, at least for the Italian, we should have the capability to go back and to understand what happened and why at a certain point the quality of the culture that we have been capable to bring of the overall discussion as Italian in some way turned toward something that has nothing, that is only kind of beautiful things. Yes, there are some beautiful in some way, but uh, without any tension toward uh, changing the, the world in which we are. That was the beginning of the story. And there are two questions at the back. If we can take those together. Um, yes, one there, and let's just take two together before you answer. Yep. Um, hi there. Um, I've actually taken part in uh, DICE's uh, project, and um, I'm an RSA fellow, but I'm also a design researcher. And one of the things that um, really struck me was how important um, both having a sort of open inquiry, but also um, being able to communicate and also empathize um, with the people that you're co-designing with. Um, and I'm wondering whether by profiling um, that kind of, those kind of soft skills as part of service design, we risk um, avoiding them applying to other parts of design as well. So I'm just wondering how you think that design culture should face that challenge of, of opening up this kind of 
um, understanding and discourse to the whole of design, not just service design in inverted commas. Okay, and uh, that question, keep that in your mind, and the question at the back. Um, hi, it's here. Sophie, for, I'm Director of Circular Economy here, for what strange title I know, but I'm also a designer. Um, I'm interested in your experience of design education, so um, this obviously is a move away from how we have traditionally seen a designer's role, so very much like a star designer. I am the only one who can deal with this, I am the man with the, or the woman with the pencil, to somebody who actually can talk to others, play well, and um, to build capability for co-design and co-creation. Are you seeing um, new generations of designers coming through your, the education system that have that capability? And if so, if not, how do we teach those skills? Okay. <laughs> Well, um, I, I think that uh, for sure understood the second question. Sorry, I, I, my English is very worse. So when I listen from here, sometimes I'm not sure that I totally understood. So the first question that I, I repeated to see if I have understood it. It was uh, if our culture uh, as a designer should be capable to bring, uh, to feed the conversation in the co-design uh, process, in the way to help this uh, discussion to move in the direction that we want, even beyond the specificity or the technicality of having this survey design or something like this. It's, l it's like this? Okay. Um, I think, in principle, yes. Second point. But we have to be very modest. So uh, when we talk about uh, how we can uh, Feed the, I use this term, to feed the conversation. That do not mean that we have the idea. So it's not the egoic design as it was. Le Corbusier that said the city of the future is like this. So it was not dialogical. It was to, to tell people how the future of the city should be. Now, we can draw a city. We can. But we can say, look, in my view, it could be like this and afterward accept the discussion. So this is, for me, the dialogic design. And dialogic design means a dialogue. And therefore, there is another risk that I've not <laughs> said until now that could be called participationism. That means the idea that a designer, when you discover that you don't want to be the egoic design that say the future is this one, you say, oh, there are all the people that are so nice, they know so much, and so I am the facilitator, and I help the discussion. But to help the discussion, as a technicality, making post-it and these kind of things, <laughs> do not bring anything to the conversation. So if everybody facilitates, who brings the ideas? <laughs> Therefore, we have to be to rediscover so what is against uh, what I call particip participationism or uh, post design, this is another way to call it, is that we have to dare to say something. And of course, to dare to say something, first, we have something to say. <laughs> so we have to have ideas. And secondly, we have to be capable to have ideas in a dialogical way. That means I say something, I listen to the others, maybe I will change, maybe I will sustain, maybe I will fight, because participation design or co-design is not simply a table that people discuss. I use the example of the community garden in New York. For me, the result today is a fantastic example of co-design. that lasted 30 years, and that started with people fighting in the streets. So the co-design is not simply politely talking, it's also fighting, also having different opinion. So it's important to be capable to manage or to, to navigate in this kind of conversations. And afterward, of course, if I have an idea, I hope that something on my idea will also influence the conversation. Moving toward the, the second question, um, I think that if everything changes, obviously also the design changes, also the school should change. But when everything changes, uh, you cannot change everything together. So there is this metaphor that is often done, change the engine or the airplane while you are flying. So you have to continue to fly, at the same time you have to change the engine. 
And this is valuable for the whole society, and it's valuable also for the school. So I'm not proposing to anybody, look, now we change everything. Because uh, nobody knows has it to be totally changed. But we have to have an experimental attitude. So experimental means more or less we leave things as they are, but we have the capability to make something very clear different and uh, to see and to learn from this experience and to be capable, if the experience is positive, to spread it. By the way, this experimental attitude is valuable not only for the School of Design. For me, all the society, we, I was uh, talking before about institutions, how the institution can change. They cannot change because the airplane uh, go down. We have to create experimental places in which institutions start to make something that is uh, not obvious, in which it's possible to make a mistake, and in which you can learn. And this is valuable also for the school. I'm not proposing to any school to change everything. I, at least, I, I cannot, I don't know it. But I know that it's very important that in every school you cultivate some area in which you start to make things radically different, to create the possibility afterwards, maybe, to extend to everybody else. And to make it something different, and you say, what is my opinion, how the student, it's very contradictory, because on one side, I observe that the number of students that participate to kind, some kind of uh, uh, working for community, with the community, for the community, and uh, working on the local, having idea of the general. So this is uh, very, I can find it everywhere. Here, I'm lucky to be professor here, but I am also in Milano, I am in China. So I have a relatively good vision of what is happening in the school. And in every school you find a lot of students that goes in this direction and teachers. At the same time, frankly speaking, uh, the emerging design to many students appear very boring. Because uh, it's participationist. Because it do not challenge. Because if you take the best student, the most creative student, and you say, you, you know what you have to do? You have to put people together and to put stickers on the wall. <laughs> and they want to say, oh, no, but I prefer the traditional design that at least is more. So I think the creativity is fundamental. So we have to introduce, to reintroduce creativity, and creativity with the meaning, uh, so with the, uh, also the motivation, into the way in which we dialogue. And, uh, I, I, I hope that this will happen, but at the moment it's not so much like this. And uh, I, I feel responsible because I've been not the only one, luckily, but with the many that promoted the strategic design, survey design, everything that happened, I have been in some way there. And now that I see that this kind of thing start to be a little bit bureaucratic, uh, I, I feel uh, guilty in some way because I said, no, but look, it should not be like this. This is not what I, well, what should be, and uh, and again, <laughs> why I'm so uh, uh, and so I don't know how to say in English, but it, uh, pushing the idea of the go back to discuss about culture, about quality, the emerging design do not talk anymore about quality, do not talk about aesthetics. It's possible to imagine a new society that emerges in which there is no aesthetics. Aesthetics is fundamental. We cannot leave the aesthetics to the marketers. Aesthetics is more fundamental than ethics. And so somebody has to deal with it. <laughs> we should. But the new design do not talk about it. Talk about its function? Yes, not. It's, it's nice, it's good. Nobody talk about it. And the only way to, to regenerate an aesthetics is to talk about it, because the aesthetic is a human construction. So if we don't have arenas in which people discuss, as the, the traditional design, they took uh, glass, and all the audience was discussing, mm, I like it, I don't like it. It's a peer, is shallow, is stupid. No, it's the only way to, to, to develop the sensitivity that permit to say we can improve this quality. And if we talk about services, have you ever heard people talking about if this service beautiful? <laughs> is this service something that really have a, a deep quality? The service has to function, has to be good impact, etc., etc. So this is what is needed in my view in this moment. It is needed in the, the school should be one of the main place in the knowledge society, the student, the school should be 
the place where the experiment happens, where this kind of discussion is pushed, where the new idea of quality emerge, where the new values emerge, and maybe also in a very uh, disruptive way. But uh, if it do not happen in the school, it's very difficult that it happen in other places. On that note, um, I'm very sorry to say that we must wrap up. I think there were probably some more questions, but I'm pleased to say that Ezio will be outside um, and there'll be copies of his books for sale and he'll be signing copies as well and I know he'll be happy to answer any further questions. So he's given us a lot to think about. I think um, I didn't want to interrupt you there because there, you, were, you were going on, on such a good idea there and I think you've given people a lot to think about. So I think it's worth... Um, listening to all of that. So please join me in thanking our very distinguished speaker, Ezio Manzini.